आख को चाहिए एक उम्र असर होने तक कौन जीता है तेरी जुल्फ के सर होने तक दामे हर मौज में है हल्के सद काम नहंग देखे क्या गुजरे है खतरे पे गोहर होने तक आशिकी सब्र तलब और तमन्ना बेताब दिल का क्या रंग करूं होने जिगर होने तक और गमे हस्ती का असद किससे हो जुजमर्ग इलाज गमे हस्ती का असद किससे हो जुजमर्ग इलाज शम्मा हर रंग में जलती है सहर होने तक है और भी दुनिया में सुखमवर बहुत अच्छे कहते हैं कि गालिब का है अंदाज बयां और देर आर मेनी पोइट्स एंड वर्ड स्मिट्स इन दिस वर्ल्ड हु आर ब्रिलियंट बट द से दैट गालिब हैज अ स्टाइल ऑफ इट्स ओन सो टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक टू एन एक्सेप्शनल इंडिविजुअल अबाउट एन एक्सेप्शनल इंडिविजुअल वी गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट गालिब हिज पोइट्री हिज मीनिंग फॉर उर्दू लिटरेचर द इम्पैक्ट दैट ही हैड ऑन इंडियन कल्चर and also his continued relevance to indian culture to indian literature and also to keeping the flame of urdu alive especially in india today i'm talking to professor meer ali raza who is a distinguished professor of management at william patterson university his work in the area of management technology transfer uh, epistemology in the issue of studying uh, management is exemplary if you want to know about his management uh, work please search for his google scholar profile and you will find most of his work there but i'm talking to the other mir ali raza who is a fan of urdu literature and has in the past few years written four books on urdu literature his first book written with his brother is called anthems of resistance it talks about poetry in urdu by progressive writers and then he wrote another book called the taste of words an introduction to urdu poetry in which there is a poem that appreciates his contributions to urdu by gulzar himself and then in the past few months literally in the last year and a half he has written two books on ghalib ghalib a thousand desires this is a brief introduction to ghalib's work he has translated several of ghalib's ghazals uh, and poems uh, from english to urdu in this and and then his latest book called murder at the mushaira by raza mir this is a novel in which ghalib plays the role of a detective there is a murder at the mushaira and ghalib has been requested by the police to help them solve the murder this is a fascinating book it's not just a murder mystery it is also a glimpse into history it's a window into Uh, the basically 18th and 19th century india uh, in delhi particularly so this is a fantastic book shashi tharoor says that this is the best historical novel that he has read so today i'm going to talk to meer ali raza about his work on ghalib his contributions uh, to the study and understanding of urdu poetry he is also writing another book on iqbal we will probably also talk about it uh so without wasting more time in talking about introductions uh let's talk to professor raza now professor mir ali raza welcome and congratulations on your book i've been reading the book it is absolutely fantastic what is interesting about this book is that uh, if you remember in the 1970s and 1980s there used to be uh, a genre of movies called the muslim interest movies you remember the nikah movie so for the first time we would watch the screen and people would say bismillah alhamdulillah subhanallah so we would get a taste of the culture that we actually lived in on the screen so while reading this book i got that feeling i said oh wow i have read thousands of novels but very rarely i don't think i've ever read a novel in which one of the characters says inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun on hearing the death of somebody else so congratulations Today we'll talk about both your books, your novel Murder at the Mushaira, and also your book on Ghalib. So before we begin, tell us who is Ghalib, and why does he fascinate you? Thank you, Muhtada. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me on this show. Uh, I have known you for thirty-seven uh, years and counting now, 
uh, coming up on 38 actually and of late i have been very impressed by the way you have conducted the conversations and so it's quite an honor for me to be a part of it mirza ghalib was is one of the most important poets i would say in any language and certainly the most important urdu poets he lived in the first half of the 18th century for the most part that is when he plied his trade and uh, the thing about ghalib that is also very fascinating is that his life coincided with a tremendous uh, amount of change that came in indian society particularly in the indo gangetic plain ghalib was born in mughal india and ghalib died in colonial india as you know the cataclysmic event that really uh, inaugurated the takeover of the indian subcontinent by the british crown from various princely states as well as the east india company is the revolt of 1857 Ghalib lived through that he lived in delhi at that point in time and so he was a ringside spectator to this so he speaks about the feudal regime and he also speaks about the modern regime during his time the postal system uh, became prominent so ghalib was possibly the first person who have written a series of letters correspondence uh so this postal correspondence is of course a uniquely modern form of communication and ghalib's letters are preserved and published so we see an understanding of how he engages with that part of modernity as well the telegraph was introduced bureaucratic rules were introduced and so ghalib fought a variety of court cases so if you chart his life just forget his uh prowess but if you chart his life it itself is very fascinating but when you come to his poetry then his poetry is is something that has of course transcended time and it is very important even today so i think he's really really uh, setting himself up to be a very appropriate uh, protagonist for a novel uh, we will talk about your novel shortly but i want to talk a little bit more about ghalib himself even for someone who is on the peripheries of urdu literature and and novice when it comes to understanding and appreciating urdu poetry uh, i can see there is something sublime of his about his poetry right away uh, and uh, it was quite obvious that he himself was aware of the fact that he was very special kehte hain ke ghalib ka andaaz e bayan aur so what is i mean is it possible for you to pin us for us what is so unique about his style which is so different because Uh, for somebody like me i could get confused between mir tafi mir momin and ghalib if i'm not familiar that a particular couplet belong to ghalib but most other people who are who have a more nuanced understanding of urdu poetry will immediately tell this is ghalib so what is that which tells you that this is ghalib <laughs> well uh, the answer to that obviously is going to be rather subjective but i don't mind giving it a shot to understand ghalib one has to understand chart the uh, emergence of urdu and of urdu poetry and i'll do it very briefly now uh, in the 13th century for example there was amir khosro in delhi who was writing in language which we now identify as urdu there was wali dakni in uh, in dakkan who went to gujarat this holy khutub shah so a lot of this particular language urdu was emerging as the people's language uh in the court system of the mogal empire and in the variety of empires that muslim empires that were ruling india at that time uh farsi uh, persian was really being uh you know it was hegemonic and so this really was the subaltern language it was the language of the people around one generation before ghalib is when urdu began to emerge as a very sophisticated language it began to borrow from turkish and farsi and of course its root uh, should i say ethos is pali and hindi and a variety of indigenous languages there were people like nazir akbar abadi but most importantly mir taqi mir who formalized a certain kind of uh, way in which urdu poetry could be declaimed and then 
conventions of how to use metaphors on what rhyme schemes to be deployed became uh, rather codified. Ghalib emerges at this time. But Ghalib simply was a genius. He was genius in several ways, but his felicity with language, his ability to pull things together. And when people are really good at language, then the idea of forming rhymes becomes secondary. So Ghalib had this line which he would say, Ke, there are two kinds of poets, those who do khafiya bandi. Khafiya bandi means they wordsmith their way to uh, ghazal. But th there are those that do mani afrini, that they take these words now and create meaning, develop meaning. Uh, and he thought of himself as a mani afrini kashayar. And so that is why most of his poems are, most of his couplets are, they often have layers. So you peel one layer, you understand it at one level, you peel one, uh, the layer and you find another meaning. And if you change the uh, subject of the, whether to turn it from God to man, for example, the, the, the same lines have different meanings. And he did this very consciously. He did this consciously, he did it deliberately, and he did it with a lot of verb. So he was fortunate enough to be valued as a great poet by the peers of his time. But there was one knock against him, which was that he was very difficult. He was very abstruse. So those people, by the way, I'm not sure that everybody can do that discerning thing. But if you would look at Mermin or Mir or somebody like that, you would say, ah, this is a simple share. So it must be theirs. If the share has too many meanings, and if it is, you know, incorporating multiple metaphors, and if it's really taking down a garden path and leading you nowhere, this probably is probably Ghalib's share. That's all. Of it. You know, I mean, you have given a good account of who Ghalib was. But who is Ghalib now? There is a lot of social construction of Ghalib. There is a revival of Ghalib. In the 1980s, there was a television show about the Ghalib. Now, thanks to the emergence of Rekhta, uh, Ghalib is becoming accessible to people who don't even read Urdu or Hindi. So translations are available and people are also transcribing uh, them in, in, you know, in... So what does Ghalib mean to people today? Like, what is he, the remnant of the past? Is, are we talking about the golden age of Urdu and Muslim culture and Mughal culture? Or does he have something meaningful to say today? I think that, I mean, you can look at it multiple ways, but yes, Ghalib evokes nostalgia. Ghalib evokes nostalgia for a bygone age. But uh, since you are a trained hermeneutician, I would also say, that what people do is they look at a share of Ghalib and say, oh, it has a lot to say about today. Uh, so there's a fair amount of that uh, reinterpretation that is going on. Uh, in a strange way, apocryphal and poor quality shares get circulated on WhatsApp saying this is by Ghalib and people still say, wow, wow, because you know, you better not say that this is a bad share if uh, Ghalib's name is attributed to it. Uh, so there is a fair amount of that. Now, I also want to put one more thing out there, that the poets that came after Ghalib, now there are two kinds of poets, those who were beholden to him, and they said, you know, all right, Ghalib ki zameen mein humne ghazal ke hai, so what's the big deal? But there were several people who were extremely upset, jealous, I would even say pissed off. Uh, so, uh, for example, there's a very good poet called Yagana Changesi. And he was constantly complaining that whatever we do in this generation, people say, oh, no, no, you can never emulate Ghalib. And then he wrote an entire screed that basically said Ghalib was a poor uh, poet, but nobody has the guts to call him out. Uh, so he evokes that envy as well, or rather, I don't know, jealousy. Uh, envy is more uh, like it because he had something that they didn't have. Uh, Ghalib is very much alive. Ghalib also becomes to us a marker of a certain kind of Urdu culture. Uh, you know, in, these, in this day and age, when a certain kind of Urdu, or I would even say Muslim culture, is constantly being viewed with suspicion, 
Ghalib stands almost like a guard saying, if you got to get rid of them, you got to get rid of me too. So, and that makes it a little difficult. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think he has become, as, as Ghalib would say, a paimana, a benchmark uh, of quality Urdu literature. Right. I want to talk about your book now. This is fascinating. Uh, it's uh, First of all, it's very well written. Uh, I could not pry it away from my wife who just started reading it and she, she used the word elevated. The writing is elevated. Uh, you know, given my intellectual background and the work I do, it's impossible for me to actually enjoy fiction anymore. So, so I, I can't read for entertainment. So while I was reading the book, I was quite fascinated by the politics of the book. There is a lot of anti-colonialism. There's a post-colonial approach. I could actually use this in a post-colonial class uh, to talk about how uh, the post-colonial subject now thinks of their present as well as the past. Mm -hmm. So th this attempt uh, to talk about uh, the British rule in India, to talk about uh, I mean, you have Muslim characters talking about Hindu festivals as if they talk about it all the time. So there is a clear attempt to show that there was harmony between the two people. And most importantly, you also projected Indian nationalism into the past. So there are, your characters are trying to say that I'm treated as such because I'm an Indian, uh, especially the cop, or the young cop who, who is surprised that he was slapped by a senior police officer who was also an Indian, right? So he can't understand that despite this shared identity of Indianness. So is there a political agenda or the, or is just entertainment? What's, what, what are you trying to do with this book? Look, let me first talk about the animating event of uh, the book, which is 1857, the revolt of 1857. Now, as you know, the revolt happens in May 1857 when a group of soldiers come from Meerut and attack the, uh, the Delhi uh, Red Fort and take it over. Now, the British always refer to it as the Sepoy Mutiny, uh, as if it was something that emerged from the barracks and stayed in the barracks. But we know, I mean, I do, uh, I do admit that uh, in this matter, I am informed by nationalist historiography. Uh, Indians often call it the first war of independence. And in my opinion, that is closer to the truth. So there are three elements here. One is the local nobility, which was oppressed by the British. The other is the soldiers who were oppressed in the barracks. And the third most important part is the local peasantry, was oppressed by what I call a dangerously efficient tax regime. Uh, I have studied 1857 quite carefully and closely by way of preparing for this book, but I will, I'm also interested in it. 1757 is when uh, the British first established a beachhead in India uh, with their victory over uh, Siraj ud at the Battle of Plassey. In 90 years, really the amount of wealth that they began to move from India immiserated the Indian peasantry so much that everybody was involved and the British were taken by surprise at how popular this revolt was. Now, I am a novelist, I'm not a historian. Historians can write it in their own way, but I wanted to represent that. In order to represent that, I needed the requisite characters. So you will find there are men there and women there who are playing role. There are uh, noble people and there are you know, servant class and peasant class people there who are also participating. And uh, it, is, it is only natural that the novel would reflect the political positions that I hold, but uh, I feel that it is quite uh, uh, authentic in its representation of the report. This is a special conversation. This is the first conversation that has been sponsored by individuals. I want to thank Ali Beg, Abrar Chishti, Gohar Khureshi, Sayyida Inamdar, Raza Khan, Moeed Muhammad, Farah Laman, Anis Ahmed, Khalid Khan, Akram Sayyid, and Sayyid Haider for sponsoring this conversation about the Ghalib. Thank you very much. I'm extremely grateful to you. And please continue to watch conversations and support conversations. We can't talk about Ghalib without talking about his poetry. So I want to ask you about some of these ghazals which I find interesting. 
So for example, if you are familiar with these two shares, Use kaun dekh sakta ki ye gana hai wo yakta Jo dui ki boo bhi hoti to kahi do char hota Ye masail tasawuf, ye tera bayan ghalib Tujhe hum wali samajhte jo na baad akhwar hota And in another ghazal, he says this share which I found fascinating Jabke tujh bin koi nahi maujud Phir ye hangama ay khuda kya hai so somebody like me who who has you know pre, uh, this predispositions towards mystical thought and uh, sentiments positive sentiments to sufism i see that he is asserting the oneness of god uh, and also talking about clearly very tasawuf like ideas uh, but then there are times when he suddenly you know you have one share which is very mystical and the next one becomes quite trivial uh, especially, uh, uh, so to what extent was he consciously, deliberately trying to send religious and mystical messages, or this was just the culture, uh, and and mysticism was so much part of that culture in Delhi that people would invoke uh, uh, mystical and Sufi themes in their conversation without it actually having any significance oh no i think ghalib was a very very deliberate sufi and within islam itself the the sort of salafi culture was entering at that point in time right it was remember it is the early 19th century so things have already happened abdul wahab has already uh, emerged out of uh, Sa saudi arabia and people are you know, bringing those ideas in. Uh, and Ghalib and some others were taking a stance for the Tasawwuf side. Ghalib also, because he was such an open-minded person, he was engaging with Hinduism as well. So in 1830 or in the late 1820s, he makes a long trip to Calcutta to pursue a case. On the way, he stops at Banaras. In Banaras, he gets very uh, influenced by certain ideas of the Bhakti tradition, or at least he becomes appreciative of them. And he wrote a uh, Farsi Masnavi called charag -e Dair, in which he referred to uh, Banaras in the following words, Ke ibadat na khusiyanast, hamana kabaye hindustanast. Okay, this is the this is the land where the conch shells blow and this is the Kaaba of India. Then he goes all the way to Calcutta where the Bhakti move, uh, sorry, the Brahmo Samaj movement is in its infancy and rationality versus spirituality, those discussions are happening. There's Michael Madhusudan Dutt and all that. So I'm assuming that he's imbibing all that. He comes to Lucknow uh, where the Shia tradition is very strong and he takes that and you know so at some level ghalib really embodied the churning the religious churning that was happening when different groups of people met and spoke at that moment in a spirit of relative equality at least having said that he was very influenced by the idea of wahdatul wujud right because jab ke tujh bin nahi koi maujood phir ye hangama ay khuda kya hai can you think of anything more uh, Sufi. But, you know, like you said, he always had a little bit of, should I say, you know, he moonwalked out of uh, a religious position. Uh, the the makta that you quoted, ke ye masayle tasawuf, ye tera bayan ghalib, right? You are such a great man, ghalib, that you speak of Sufism, tujhe hum wali samajhte. We would have thought of you as a holy man, if you had not been a drinker. So I am so in some sense he kind of takes just a little bit of you know pinch out of his uh, prescriptions. Uh, he was quite a believer and he was quite uh, engaged, but he wanted to do it on his own terms and he was very, very uh, should I say scornful of the clergy. If you read his poems, you get a lot of that. You know, uh, it's interesting that you talked about uh, one of his masnavis. Uh, 
I was surprised uh, while I was reading about the Ghalib uh, in order to talk uh, to you. I discovered that he his work in Persian is far more voluminous than his work in Urdu, but he, he does not enjoy the same degree of recognition for his Persian work as he did. It, it reminded me of Michael Jordan, who had a foray into baseball, if you remember. Nobody remembers Michael Jordan's performances in baseball. And, and so Ghalib you know, is not in the same league as Rumi or Hafez or even Iqbal uh, with their Persian poetry. So so this is the question. Was is the standard of Urdu poetry so low that Ghalib stood tall among Urdu poets? And then when he joined the Persian pantheon, he was exposed as not so great. Or like, how do we un- explain the, the fact that he was successful in one genre and not the other? Yeah. Uh, Ghalib, of course, to understand that, you have to understand Urdu. Urdu is a subaltern language. It's the language of the masses. Everybody is speaking Urdu. But in the court system, uh, Persian is being valued. Uh, Persian, as it moves down, you know, if you go back down to, you know, uh, Mashhad or Tabrez or other places, a certain kind of Persian is spoken, which you might say is really pure Persian. As it comes down to Afghanistan, it becomes Dari, and then it comes down to India. Uh, there is this uh, a variety of people who are creating the grammar of an Indianized Persian. It's called Sabke Hindi. And one of the perf- persons who was involved with that was Bedil. Uh, who Ghalib thought of as his master. At some point in time, uh, around the time when Ghalib went to Calcutta and all that, when he was hardly a 35-year-old man, he decided, uh, rather mystifyingly, to write only in Persian. And the problem really is that his his Persian verses uh, were challenged by people on grounds, on grammatical grounds, and he got into a mi- lot of minute arguments about, you know, syntax and uh, whether a metaphor can be used or not. Uh, I personally feel that it was a very dry period uh, of his poetry. And right now, uh, you know, with the distance of two centuries, we realize that Ghalib's Urdu poetry has lasted very well. His understanding of Urdu poetry was so instinctive and he layered Persian onto his Urdu in a beautiful way. But in Persian itself, in pure Persian itself, for reasons that are beyond my pay grade, uh, his uh, poetry did not really uh, uh, get much traction. And so uh, you are absolutely right. One of the great delights of our life is that Michael Jordan stopped playing baseball and came back and repeated again with the Bulls. But imagine if Michael Jordan had played 10 years of baseball. That is what Ghalib did with his career. For 10 years or much more than that, 15 years, he just wrote only in Persian uh, verses that are essentially lost to us. So, yeah, glad he came back. uh, uh, When I was writing a book on Islamic mysticism. Uh, I looked at a lot at the poetry of uh, Ibn Arabi and, and Rumi, uh, and uh, but when I started looking at Ghalib, uh, I was surprised to see that you know it's not just Ghalib. If you also listen to the Khawalis that uh, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan sings, for example, a lot of the mystical thought, uh, which is in Urdu is extremely influenced by Ibn Arabi. Even though there is a lot of, uh, if you mention him, there is a lot of opposition to him because of the idea of Wahadat al-Wujud, which is often misunderstood as pantheism. Uh, so do, do you also sense uh, that uh, that Ghalib's was uh, ideas were you know, quite influenced by maybe Rumi and, and Ibn Arabi and others? I'm sure if he's reading Persian, I'm sure he has read Rumi uh, obviously, and uh, was he also trying to become part of that genre? Uh, your knowledge is in this matter is greater than mine, Muqtadar. I am I'm, I'm right. I just finished writing a book on Iqbal, and to that extent, I came across this idea that Iqbal, for example, was very, very hostile to Ibn Arabi in his later life, uh, and he developed his idea of Khudi uh, principally as. Uh, 
you know, opposition to those kind of uh, ideas. Uh, I would say without uh, as much knowledge as I should have, that Ghalib was perhaps influenced by Ibn Arabi, uh, but I do not have any documentary evidence to that, so I'll leave it there. You know, I'm looking at this book of yours, The Taste of Words, and in the foreword, Gulzal says some, actually writes a nice ghazal about you, a poem about you, in which he says, Janab Razamir, Urdu mein aap ka hissa yaad rahega. I mean, that's just a great compliment. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I apologize if it's going to offend you in advance. Okay? So, but your contributions to Urdu are great, fantastic, poetry, history, novel, etc. Another one coming. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, just based on your work on Urdu, you could get tenured as a professor of Urdu Urdu culture, etc., have another job. But are you the Harsha Bhogle of Urdu Adab? You will have to tell me. I mean, I know Harsha. Harsha is a commentator who does not, who has not played. Is that? Uh, oh. That's the point I'm trying to make. Harsha Bhogle is probably the best cricket commentator, knows more about cricket than anybody else, but has never played a cricket match. You write so much about Urdu Adab and Urdu literature. So when is your book of Urdu Ghazals or your book in Urdu showing up? Well, I have tremendous respect for Harsha Bhogle based on what I have uh, seen. Uh, and so I think I will stay there. I know enough about Urdu poetry to know that uh, the Urdu poetry I write would be rather crappy. So, and the interesting thing about Urdu is that, which I have written in Taste of Words is, that for the longest time, people are saying that it's a dying language. But the damn thing has been dying for 200 years. And even today, as Urdu is dying in front of our eyes, there are so many good poets. And there are poets who are doing incredibly new things with poetry. Uh, the language is actually alive and vibrant and in the ethos of the lived experience of people. So I find enough good Urdu poetry to captivate me. Uh, I have a very specific role for myself. I see a very specific role for myself. And perhaps uh, I could count you among my uh, companions in this regard. I am a translator. Uh, I am mobile between languages and between cultures. So my role is to take stuff from this uh, milieu and bring it to the other milieu in a manner that is palatable to the people of the other side. And there I have found some competence. And I think I'll work that aspect of my personality uh, as much uh, as I can. Uh, as far as you know, creating new stuff is concerned, I believe that my novel has done that. But in the world of poetry, no, I'll be terrible. Not so much in, in Urdu poetry, but look, I read some of your translations and uh, translations are also commentaries in themselves. They are not just translations. They are uh, a way of looking at it. Uh, I played a small game last night where I picked one or two shares of Ghalib and I translated them myself. And they were very clearly different from the way you had translated them. So it is clear that, that we are also doing commentary when we translate. But some of the insights that you brought, especially in this book about Ghalib and Urdu language, uh, I think it would be beneficial to people who are Urdu, da, who read Urdu, who do Urdu poetry, who are studying. So if this book, maybe you could get it translated, uh, you know, in Urdu and it might be beneficial. But coming back to this issue of Urdu dying, I mean, my interest in Urdu came alive after listening to Rahat Indori. I mean, his poetry to me was made me alive. You know, I accidentally discovered him on YouTube and then I watched every YouTube video that I could find. Uh, and I was actually thinking uh, of writing an article about his poetry uh, as essentially a, a discourse of the subaltern against especially the current regime in India. But unfortunately he died uh, before I could even meet with him. But I have this question in this book, you talk about the Urdu century, basically coming across from the 18th to the 19th century. The peak of Urdu language, at least from 
cultural perspective seems to coincide with the decline of the Mughal empire and Muslim power in India. So Urdu is at its best, at its peak, at the decline of the, of the Muslim power. Uh, is it just a historical coincidence or should we draw some meaning in it that the, the, the kind of culture in which uh, Urdu is surviving is uh, anachronistic to modern ways of doing things, modern ways of thinking, uh, even in Pakistan, where Urdu is a, an important language, uh, it is associated with uh, people who are, I don't know, you get my point, I suppose. I get your point, and uh, I, I mean, the way I prefer to see it, uh, the way I prefer to see it is that Urdu was a, Urdu is a very, very multicultural language. It is a language that embodies heterogeneity and it also embodies a space where people can work out difference. So the emergence of Urdu in the Indo-Gangetic plane in particular coincided with the attempts of human beings of multiple cultural backgrounds to live together uh, in a certain kind of, uh, if not harmony, at least a mutual understanding. And to that extent, I see the decline of Urdu as a decline of those kind of shared, uh, dare I say, syncretic values. And if you see, the opposition to Urdu has always come from extremists. Of course, you have heard, I mean, you know, uh, Hindutva politicians have often said that Urdu is a Muslim language and it has to be thrown away. But you would be surprised to know that when the Quran was translated into Urdu, a certain uh, kind of uh, mullah class also opposed it, saying that this is a language of idol worshippers. So it's not as if it gets flack only from one side. So Urdu is, if you if you recast Urdu as the language of engagement, then you know the decline of Urdu is the decline of engagement. So, so when I was in India, I could not read Urdu, even though I could read the Quran and read Arabic. And I started reading Urdu only after coming here and studying uh, Arabic as an Urdu, uh, as a language. But oftentimes, a lot of people used to say that uh, Urdu is the third language of Islam uh, after Arabic and Persian, uh, and actually making the claim that there is more of Islamic literature in Urdu than there is in any other language other than Persian or, or Arabic. Uh, it's quite possible now that English is probably overtaking all these languages, one partly through translation and partly through new content. So everything that is available in these languages may be available in English, and then there is new content produced. So is that also something that, uh, you factor that in in the way you think about Urdu and Urdu Adab and Urdu culture and talking about Urdu uh, as language of engagement, that it is also one of the most prominent languages of Islam in terms of Islamic literature. I mean, some, some, the, some of the greatest works in the yeah. continent is in Urdu. It is a very important language of Muslims. I wouldn't call it the language of Islam. Uh, but you should also know that there are 683 translations of the Ramayana in Urdu, uh, out of which at least 34 of them are uh, manzoom, which means that they are actually in poetry. This is a copy of the Bhagavad Gita that was translated into uh, as, as poetry into Urdu. Uh, I have it in Hindi script, but it is Urdu Shairi Me Gita by Anwar Jalal Puri. So there's a lot of that. So it works both ways. It works both ways. So uh, who it's the readers oh. who this is because a lot of Hindus were reading in the Urdu script. Yeah. Is that why? Yeah. You know, there was a, I mean, if you want to talk about the suppression of the Urdu script, again, that is a different matter, but it was actually happened in the, uh, uh, during in independent India. And uh, ironically, and this is perhaps a good way, place to stop this uh, discussion, to bring it to a conclusion. Uh, Ghalib died in 1869. So in 1969, the hundredth anniversary of his death was uh, 
rather well celebrated in independent India. And Sahir Ludhyanvi, one of my favorite poets, uh, wrote a rather bitter poem called Gandhi Ho Ke Ghalib Ho. I'm going to just read that, uh, declaim that. Ke ekkis baras guzre azadi e kamil ko, tab ja ke kahi humko ghalib ka khayal aya. Turbat hai kaha uski, maskan tha kaha uska, ab apne sukhan parwar zehno mein sawal aya. Sao saal se jo turbat chadar ko tarasti thi, आज उस पे अकीदत के फूलों की निमाइश है उर्दू के ताल्लुक से कुछ भेद नहीं खुलता ये जश्न ये हंगामे خدمت है के साजिश है जिन शहरों में गूंजी थी غالب की नवा बरसों उन शहरों में आज उर्दू बेनाम और निशा ठहरी आजादी ए कामिल का ऐलान हुआ जिस दिन मातूब जुबान ठहरी गद्दार जुबान ठहरी जिस अहदे सियासत ने ये जिंदा जुबान कुचली उस अहदे सियासत को मरहूमों का गम क्यों है غالب جسے کہتے ہیں اردو ہی کا شاعر تھا اردو پہ ستم ڈھا کر غالب پہ کرم کیوں ہے یہ جشن مبارک ہو پر یہ بھی صداقت ہے ہم لوگ حقیقت کے احساس سے آری ہیں گاندھی ہو کے غالب ہو احساس کی انصاف کی نظروں میں ہم دونوں کے قاتل ہیں دونوں کے پجاری ہیں so. well, that's, that's a great way to end this conversation and, uh, and I wish you all the best uh, the book is doing well. Congratulations. Uh, and I think we will continue this conversation after your book on Iqbal comes out. Is it going to be exactly like this or any different? Very similar. Very similar. Thank you, Bukhtadar. And you have a wonderful day. Bye.